Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Yandy Reynoso and I am one of the advisors at Education USA in Mexico City. Um, today, this session, this live session, uh, um, we, we will talk about uh, the different college experiences that some um, of our Education USA interns uh, this summer from the University of Chicago uh, will be sharing uh, with us more about this topic and their experience, their experience as a Latin student in the US. Um, so before we start, um, just a few things. Uh, we will ask you to please uh, turn off your cameras as well as your microphones. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, make sure to send those questions to the user Q&A if you are in Zoom. Um, if you're watching us from Facebook, type them in the comments sections and we will review them at the end of the presentation. I also want to uh, add that there's a future on the bottom of the screen uh, where you can activate subtitles if you want to follow that as well. Um, before I give the time to our interns, um, I would like to introduce and briefly talk about what Education USA. Uh, we are a US Department of State network of over 430 international student advising centers in more than 175 countries and territories. Our network promotes US higher education to students around the world by offering accurate, comprehensive, and current information about the different opportunities available for you to study at accredited institutions in the US. We are your official source on US higher education. Uh, remember that all of our services and activities, such as workshops, webinars, uh, personalized sessions are free of charge. So if you're interested, interested in learning a little bit more about our services and activities, um, I invite you to get in contact with your closest Education USA Advising Center by visiting our official website, educationusa.state.gov. You can, you're able to see that on screen as well. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so whether you plan to pursue a short term or full degree program in the US, um, Education USA has the resources you need in, in your five steps to study to the US. So now uh, I'll just give you the time to Marcela, Alexis and Aura, uh, who they will be conducting this session. Thank you. Hey everyone, thank you guys so much for being here. To start off, we're just gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves with a little bit of information so you guys at least know who you're talking to. But um, like Andy said, we are all summer interns. Hello everyone, my name is Aura. I go by she, her, her, she, her, hers pronouns. And I am an intern this summer with Education USA Guadalajara. Um, just like the rest of the panelists, I go to the University of Chicago and I'm double majoring in mathematics and psychology. So if you're interested in that, definitely um, ask questions. And I'll go ahead and leave it to Marcela. Hi, my name is Marcela Madrid. Um, I also go by she, her, her pronouns. Um, I am probably going to double major in art history and public policy. Um, my photo is a little bit showing of my love of art with um, a nice dog sculpture. So hopefully you enjoy that in the background. Um, so yeah. And hello, everyone. I am Alexis Paredes. I also, as Aura said, a U Chicago student, and I work at Education USA Mexico City with Marcela, and I will be majoring in political science. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we will proceed with the questions. So our first section will be essays. Sorry, Aura, and I'll let you present the first question. No, yeah, you're totally fine. So like Alexis said, um, the first topic we'll be covering is essays. And if you've ever, if you've never heard, the University of Chicago is known for having what we call this uncommon essay, where they ask you a really random question that um, the panelists will explain a little bit more. But the, with that, the first question we have today is what was your University of Chicago uncommon essay prompt? 
Marcela, Alexis, whoever wants to go ahead and go first, I think we'll all answer this question. So I'm fine to go first. Um, my University of Chicago Uncommon Essay prompt was talk about an arch nemesis. So basically they're talking about how like in literary um, structures, you have like Dorothy and the Wicked, we Wicked Witch of the West and things like that. So it's talking about like, who is your arch nemesis? So I went a little bit meta with mine and I said my arch nemesis arch nemesis was failure. And so I basically wrote about my first experiences with failure and how I failed along the way throughout life and how failure at the end of the day, though is my arch nemesis, I will not let it beat me. And then Marcela, do you wanna answer what yours was? Yeah. Um... So my prompt was um, a little bit different. Um, so technically it was dog and cat, coffee and tea, great Gatsby and cat turns awry. Everybody knows there are two types of people in the world. What are they? Um, and I decided that the two types of people in the world were people who did not like pineapple on pizza and people who did like pineapple on pizza. And I was vouching for the people who do like pineapple on pizza. It was very comical and very controversial as seen with or Aura's face. Um, and um, I tried to write it like a debate speech and I had never done debate. So it was very fun to write and very interesting to research about pineapple on pizza, so. Yeah, I have to disagree with you there. I am no pineapple on pizza gang. So um, yeah, my face was kind of just an immediate reaction to that. But yeah, it's very interesting that all of our topics are so different because mine, was like a whole different section. My question was, um, if I remember it correctly, it's cats have nine lives, Pac-Man has three, radioactive isotopes have a half life. Um, talk about something in your life that has like a set lifespan or whatever. And y'all, when I tell y'all this is the best writing I've ever had, this was my best essay. I wrote about a comal. I wrote about um, a comal and the lifespan of a comal and how it only ever lasts 10 months. And I wrote about it in the second person, which blew my mind. And yeah, it was just a really fun essay to write. And I basically just wrote about my own life and like my family, but from the perspective of a Coman, which plays such an important role in my life, you know? So it was like, I don't know. It was creative genius, if I will, in my opinion. So yeah, you can really have fun with the University of Chicago Uncommon Essays. So if you're looking to write a fun essay, definitely apply here. But yeah, I think with that, we can go ahead to our next question. Yeah, and our second question for our essays is, do you think that there are any essay topics that should be avoided? I'd say the essays to avoid would be like, I guess like self-congratulatory essays where it makes you sound like you've done no wrong ever because at the end of the day, universities wanna to get to know you. They don't wanna like know like, the polished perfect version, like they wanna see growth, they wanna see change, they wanna see all that. So if your essays are only talking about things like all your successes and not discussing any hardships you've had or any weaknesses or things like that, they're not gonna properly be able to understand who you are as a person. So I would say stay away from essay topics that only show positives. Kind of along those lines, there's a popular essay topic that like if you go to any panel it's like actively avoid this topic but it's like the winning the big game essay which if you've ever played any sports and like you like there's this essay prompt or this essay topic that a lot of athletes talk about where like oh it was the day of the big game I was under pressure and then we won the game and now I'm good um I don't know the exact reasons why but you should definitely not write about that topic just because it's like what Alexis was talking about that congratulating myself without speaking about the hardships so that's not something that um, colleges really want to see when you write. And I had one, oh, the one essay that I would mention is that any essay about like an important figure in your life, I'm not telling you not to write about your inspirations, but the thing to watch out with these types of essays, like if you write about a role model, is that what happens a lot is students start writing the essay about the role model instead of about, instead of about themselves. So I don't be like, oh, this is my role model, this is why they're so cool, they're so amazing. And the admissions officer is like, okay, but what about you? 
So you can write about role models, but you want to write about how that role model impacted you and how they changed your life, not about why they're your role model, if that makes sense. Um, if I could add something quickly, kind of going alongside what Alexis was saying about congrats congratulating yourself try not to write essays that are sort of going into like savior complex territories where you go off into trips I'm not saying you shouldn't do community service or go on do trips but sometimes these essays can read off as very like look at me I went out to this community and helped them and you know it gets tricky and you might present yourself as a very you know arrogant or just not the way you would want to present yourself as a college possible rising college student so try to avoid you know the congratulatory even when you're in community service or any type of trips per se thank you and we'll move on to the next essay question which is what advice would you give a student writing a college app uh, college application essay So I know for me, the oh, I'll let you go actually, Aura. I'll let, I'll let you go. No, uh, I'm sorry, Alexis. I didn't see that you were unmuting, but I was just gonna say that the number one thing I like to tell students is that essays are vibe checks. And if you, the school does not like your vibe, then it's not gonna accept you. Like, and you might be sitting there, what do you mean by this? Well, essays are really important to applications because it's really the chance for you to elaborate a little bit about who you are. Because think of a college application without the essay. You have numbers, grades, test scores, what you did after school. But a lot of the times, that doesn't really tell the full story. So essays are your chance to tell the full story. They ask you, why do you want to go here? Well, I, I want to go here because I was inspired by this from my childhood, blah, blah, blah. And then bam, the college knows a little bit more about your story. So my number one tip is because these essays are so important to telling the college about who you are, is you can't lie about it. You can't lie about who you are. I'm not saying you can't like exaggerate a little bit, but like at some point the exaggeration becomes too much. And then you you're turning in an application that isn't you. And then what happens is the school, either A, the school sees that it's not you based on the rest of your application and then bam, they reject you. Or B, which could be a little bit worse, the school accepts you, you go there and you don't enjoy your time there because you don't belong there, but you get there because you turn in an essay that wasn't about you, that put out a fake you. So um, that's kind of what I mean when I tell students, make sure that whatever you're writing is true to yourself because schools can tell when it isn't. And if they can't, then you're just uh, making more problems for yourself, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree there. I would add, like that's one thing I was gonna say is like make sure that you're being authentically you. Like this is not the time to start whipping out your thesaurus and like adding all these crazy huge words because if it's not words you use commonly and it's not your type of like vernacular that you use in common, then you're putting off an image that doesn't show colleges why you deserve to be there. I know I had this issue when I was applying to colleges that I had all these like big dream schools that I wanted to go to. And so because of that, I started portraying myself in a way that just wasn't authentically me. And so for that reason, if you end up doing what I would have said, if you like put on this persona, you get accepted to this school that you think was a perfect fit for you. And it's not because it's a perfect fit for a non-authentic part of yourself, then you're gonna end up like not enjoying your time there. You end up resenting being there in the first place. Because like, honestly, if you're being true to yourself in your essays, because I've always said that the essays are the most important part of your application. Because at the end of the day, they have thousands of students that have probably the same SAT score as you, around the same grade as you, taking the same extra curriculum as you. The essays are the only time where they get to see you as a person, not just an applicant. So make sure that you're taking the time to like write your essay. Also, another piece of advice I would give is that don't give it to your friends or like your parents to read, because for the most part, they already know you and they already have this view of you. So they're not going to be able to give you a lot of feedback about essays because they already know who you are as a person. The issue is that these college advisors don't know you. And so for that reason, you might leave things out within your essay that your friends, your mom, your sibling, they'll be able to already fill in those things because they already know you. But if those holes aren't able to be filled by college 
like app like call it admission boards they're not going to get to see the full picture of you and if i could add i think this is kind of just like a basic writing tip but if you don't know what to write just start writing and keep writing because the more you write you know the more you can go in detail the more you can write about yourself and really like figure out where you want to go plus some essays are really short and you can take a part of like if you make a giant essay you can take a part of it and use it for like a supplement and then use another part of it for another essay. But it's better to just keep writing and write more because you can always subtract and you can always make it under the word limit, but it becomes much harder to then say you're really short on words or you just know you can write more, but you don't know what to write. It's better to subtract than to add. So. No, yeah, that's 100% true. Um, and no, sorry, before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to add to like both of your points, like the family thing, Alexis, that you're talking about and the like writing everything out that you're talking about, Marcella, I'm literally witnessing it happen right now because my younger sister is applying to colleges and literally I read her essay and I was like, oh yeah, this is good. But I was sitting here like, but that's because I want it to be good because I want you to be good because I'm your sister. So I'm like, you have to give it to someone else to read. And then my sister, like uh, obviously, see the same girl um she wrote her essay she just started writing she just started writing her essay once at like two in the morning she was like i must sit and write this essay right now and that's what happens and i don't know about alexis and marcella but i hear it all the time students at our school they they tell me i wrote my common app at four in the morning i got hit with inspiration and i kept writing so um, it's definitely not uncommon but with that we can go ahead and move on to the next se section of the presentation. I just wanted to uh, give a little real life example. But now we're gonna go ahead and talk to you guys about extracurriculars, both um, in high school and college. And with that, the first question that we have today for the panelists is, from your experience, what do colleges look for in extracurriculars? So I'm happy to answer this one. I was the type of person that in high school, I was in literally everything. Like freshman year of high school, I was in like 14 clubs. And then eventually I dwindled down to by the time I was in senior year of high school, I was in seven. Like I was a crazy person, literally did. I was in drama club at one point. I was in a photography club at one point. I literally am the worst taking pictures. So I don't know how I ended up in a photography club, but like I was just literally involved in everything. And that's not what colleges look for. I mean, like, it's great to see, like, they see you're like interested in, in like participating things, but colleges at the end of the day want to see what you're passionate about and they want to see growth. Like that's like the number one thing colleges are looking for is growth. So for example, I joined a bait club my freshman year. I was an officer by my sophomore year. And then by senior year, I was president of the club and I was working for like the national chapter of like this debate club I was a part of. And that's what schools want to see. They want to see growth. They want to see that you started something and you ended up, even if you're not becoming an officer, they want to see that you're going on like, if they have trips or if they have like, like participations, like debate tournaments and things like that. They want to see that you're actively participating in these clubs rather than passively being in them. Cause that's something that's always driven me insane is the kids that senior year decided to like join all these clubs who had looked at on college application. It doesn't like the school does not care that you did student council for one year in senior year like that's not what's going to help they want to see what you're interested in and it's totally fine to not find your thing instantly like I'm not saying if you haven't joined a club by your freshman year you're not getting into college like that's not at all it because I know I had friends that joined clubs junior year or even senior year that actually grew within those times so it's a matter of actually like taking initiative to do things like let's say you do join like student government senior year because this is something that I know my friends did. It's a matter of like, instead of just like being in it, did you help plan homecoming? Did you help plan spirit weeks? Like they wanna see what you've done to help better these clubs. So that's the biggest thing I would say for extracurriculars, just like growth. Yeah, and kind of adding on to that, it's like with the whole 14 clubs, like, I'm sorry, girl, that was that is too much you were doing a little too much freshman year like this is a call out okay you do not need to be doing all of that because what happens is you're going to get burnt out really quick which um is something you evidently want to avoid so what i did or at least in my experience with my extra extracurriculars i had like three big things 
and then everything else was kind of like tiny within it so personally I was on swim for, I was on a swim team for like all four years but then throughout the year when I wasn't on my swim team I was helping at other swim meets you know so it's like it's a different extracurricular but it's still dedication to the same type of thing so what schools look like for is that kind of dedication and like Alexa said that growth often comes from dedication right if you spend the time in a club and you're and you think the club is worth it eventually you'll grow to a leadership position and that's something that can really help your college application so really just just dedication to a, to a club or even just um find or just even having a small variety of what kinds of clubs you join is something that that really helps a college application here in the US marcela uh anything you like to say I think it's just like same experience as you, Orda. Like I had three main things and I stuck with them since freshman year. And I was like, I was actually really worried because like I only have three things. I, everyone else I know has like so many clubs, but then I realized I've been doing them since freshman year and I have a leadership position in all three of them. And that's actually really good because I could talk about them in depth when it came to supplements or when it even came to essay topics or just in general, it helped me out to really know those three extracurriculars really well and I still got to participate like in other clubs as well at my school but you know don't worry if you only have one or two because if they're like the things you love to do then you are perfectly fine I think if we're ready to move on we'll go on to the next question and this is me right yeah. Okay. How do you look for extracurriculars on college? So in my experience, the way I found extracurriculars, um, the University of Chicago provides a website with all their organizations on it. And it's called Blueprint, I think. And on that website, it's every single school registered organization on campus. And U Chicago has 400 plus according to their website. So you know that there's a lot. So what I did was I sorted by category. I was like, okay, I want to get out of here, get out of my room and exercise with a group, which evidently did not happen due to COVID, but that's another story. So I would look for athletic clubs and I, would, I wrote down the club names and I was like, okay, I'm gonna explore these clubs. And what I did from there after I had a list is I went to what is called at UChicago an RSO fair, but in any other school, it's just a club fair. Schools, especially if you're a first year at the school, they host this kind of fair at the beginning of the year where all of the clubs kind of advertise to you. They're like, hey, join our club if you're interested in this, or hey, you should come to a club meeting. So what I did, because our, our fair was actually virtual due to COVID, I took that list of names and I went to the fair and I just visited each booth, you know, or each like virtual booth. And I just visited the clubs, learned a little bit about them. And then from there, I chose which clubs I was gonna participate in for the year. So mine is a very, my story was a very clear cut, just look for clubs, go to the fair, find the clubs, see what happens. That's kind of what it was like in my experience. I'm not sure about Marcella and Alexis, but that's kind of what it was like for me. For me, it was kind of similar. The way I tackled it is that, like I said, I was a crazy person that was in seven clubs my senior year. So basically I was trying to find what, because obviously like these clubs I had been in, I've done them for years. And so I was like, okay, cool. Like, obviously I was passionate about this now. So let's see if there's an equivalent of it in college. So like, for example, I did debate all four years of high school. I love debate. And then, so I decided to check out uh, one of the debate societies at UChicago. And this is also like an important thing that like I went to meeting and I didn't really enjoy it. Like despite doing debate for years, it's okay to find, like not have the same passions because college is a lot different than high school. Same thing as like middle school is different than high school. So obviously like when I got into it, I really wasn't like, this, I'm like, this isn't really my vibe anymore. Like despite like debating my thing, I think I'm gonna like step away from it. And that's totally okay too, is that like if you get a college and something you thought you'd love, you don't, like it's totally fine. Like U Chicago has so many clubs. Like we have a zombie apocalypse club that the university loves to show off. Like, I don't really know what they do. I'm super intrigued to like, just sit in on a meeting to like hear what they do. But um, I know for me, like the club I got really into was like cultural organizations, which I wasn't expecting. Cause like my, the cultural organizations we had in my high school were like kind of pitiful. Like there wasn't much going on. It was just like a bunch of like people just sitting in a room talking. Like there wasn't much organization. And I ended up joining it this year and now I'm like an officer and like, I love it. And something that's important that has like relates to this is like, look out for like 
fun events that clubs do because clubs love to like incentivize people to join so like I know for example like my club um, which is like the organization of Latin American students we're like having a picnic called La Bienvenida to like invite other Hispanic students to come so like look out for like fun things because like I know that our the camping club at UChicago is like doing camping for students and like if you want to get involved like go to the fun like why not go to like the fun events where like they'll give you like food and like free merch like check those out because honestly like you might find a passion that you weren't expecting to find. Um, something small I could add about finding them. Sometimes they'll just be posted like around your dorm and it'll just like be events that RSOs are hosting and it's like in the bathroom or like right as you leave. So even if you don't, you know, you don't get to go to these club fairs or you just, you know, you just forget about it. Sometimes they'll just pop up like right in front of your door. So, and there's always going to be a lot. So it's okay to like, you know, look around and see what interests you. It's kind of funny Marcela says that because I know something my like my house would do is that if there was important information they'd put it in the bathroom stalls so like when you like went into the bathroom like there'd just be a poster there so like literally just look around like you'll find posters and flyers for like literally everything so even if you like miss things like RSO fairs like like Marcela said they're gonna do their best to advertise it whether it's on like Instagram or on Facebook or in bathroom stalls so just keep an eye out. And for the next question is what kind of extracurriculars should you look for in college? I can go ahead and take the first answer. So the kind of extracurriculars I would suggest um, like what Alexis did is maybe if you want to do something that you did in high school, um, continue something, continue it or find something similar to it and see if you still enjoy it. And if you do, great. But if you don't, also great. You know, it's up to you. It's your life. But what I would suggest doing is taking at least one extracurricular that's out of your comfort zone. So college is all about exploring and it's about doing new things. And so if you, you should definitely use the opportunities that these extracurriculars provide and just try something new. Like, oh, you want, you've never, you've always wanted to learn how to knit, join knitting club. What's the worst that could happen? You go to a meeting and you don't come back. So no one cares if you go to a meeting and don't come back. You can do whatever you want. You can explore whatever you want. So if there's something that you're interested in or that you've always been intrigued by or something that's just out of your comfort zone, I think that this is definitely something that you should look for when you get to college. Something else I suggest is like looking for like extracurriculars that might relate to career paths you want to take. Because like, for example, if you want to like do a career path and they have a club for it, it might be helpful to join that club and see if you actually enjoy the work that they do or enjoy like the environment that's created because you don't want to like do nothing with the career path you want to do. And then you finally get into like the actual workforce and be like, this isn't really my vibe. Like in a way extracurriculars can be an opportunity for you to like kind of like trial run what you want to do. So also like look out for that if that's something you're interested in. Like if you're wanting to go into like law school eventually, like join a like a pre-law group or like a pre-law frat or anything like that and try to like get the environment because maybe you like find out you're like, mm, maybe this isn't really for me. And you can like find something else that you're passionate about. Whoopsies. Um, I think Alexis and Arda have said most part covered everything all I've done if anything is like make sure you have one that's academic and one that you can really enjoy um or one that's like outside your comfort zone as I was saying but yeah yeah and with that we're going to go ahead to um Latin experience in the states and this, these are just um some general questions about being Latin or being Latin American and studying in the United States so yeah let's get let's get to it so, okay, so the first question is, what is it like going to a PWI? Now, before people start answering, let me go ahead and define this. PWI is a term or it's more of an acronym used in the United States to describe institutions or to describe colleges and universities that have a predominantly white um, student population. So that means that 50% or more of the students identify as white people. So 
Um, it's our, our, our school, the University of Chicago is predominantly white and go, being a person of color at these kinds of institutions definitely, um, definitely opens up avenues for some experiences. Um, I'm, that's all I'm gonna leave it at, but um, Alexis and Marcella, whoever wants to go ahead and go first, what is it like for you guys going to a PWI? Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, for me, it's kind of interesting because my high school was also technically um, a PWI, um, and not only like in terms of like being white, but also also having a lot of um, upper class um, students. So I'm kind of sadly used to it. Um, there, there is something of, of a culture shock when you go in and you don't really see people who share your culture. And as someone who's been kind of dealing with that since I've been around like 13, I'm 19, turning 20 soon. It's kind of, I wouldn't say sad, but at school, you know, it's harder for me to always find people who share the same, you know, traditions and background as me. So it's always nice when you do find those people and you do want to, you know, connect with them and, you know, be friends and I don't know, just like be closer to them because sometimes it is kind of, um, it is kind of, uh, I forgot the word, but you just feel disconnected sometimes from your fellow peers when you, they're very different from what you grew up to know. In common. So. Yeah, I know for me, I think the biggest thing about like going to a PWI is that I feel like oftentimes, especially because we go to a like New Chicago specifically, like usually it's upper, um, like upper or even high, like, I can't remember the word right now. Uh, upper class people, I don't think that's the correct phrase, but I can't remember what the correct one would be right now. Like it's a higher socio a socioeconomic level, like people are going. And so oftentimes I feel like because of that, a lot of them haven't been around a lot of people of color. So it's like a learning experience for them in a way. Um, I know like for me, for example, like teaching people, it's not okay to touch my hair. Um, is like a big thing that I've had to experience, especially because like a lot of people, like they've been around people with very similar hair textures for their whole life, or like they've been close with friends, that it's okay to touch the hair. And so for me, having people I don't know, like just come up to me and like try to, I'm like, mm, I don't know you, let's maybe not do this. So I know for me, like that's the biggest thing is like little things like other people that haven't been around people of color, like have a lot of questions and like, you're not obligated to be their teacher. But I know for me, like it's a lot of like just educating people on like little things about like how I was raised or like things that are acceptable and not acceptable. So I know that's like the biggest things I've noticed going to a PWI. Yeah, for me, it's not exactly a similar situation to Marcella, but almost is because I went to a PWI as a child, like elementary school, I was surrounded um, by people who identified as white. And then uh, elementary to early middle school, I went to a complete opposite school. And then from seventh grade to 12th grade, I went to a PWI. Um, so yeah, it's like um, Marcella said, it's kind of sad, but I'm already kind of used to being in the minority, I guess you could say. Um, so coming to U Chicago, everything that I saw was kind of like the norm for me at least. But I think the biggest thing to watch out for is that kind of culture shock, because especially if you're coming internationally, if you're coming from Mexico and you haven't been surrounded by um, a people who identify as white your whole life, coming to a PWI, you'll kind of see, I don't know, I don't want to, I don't know how to say it like properly, but it kind of gives you like a real perspective on what like the actual like outside world looks like if you come from a place that's predominantly people of color to a place that is predominantly white it definitely shifts your worldview and it kind of opens your eyes to like hey this is kind of like what the rest of the world is like or hey this is kind of what like the rest of the united states is like you know so it definitely puts things into perspective for you but you know like alexa said it's definitely a learning experience um it's definitely something else and the culture shock can be real if it's something that you're not used to like my lesson the only another thing that just like popped up to me like for, like this is something that was like really minor and like it's not like a huge like deal but like for example Hispanics for the most part I feel like we're very superstitious so like little things I would do that I was always raised to do they think it, like I had a lot of like white peers but I were very confused by it like for example like I don't put my purse on the floor like 
that might have been raised like do not put your purse on the floor because like the Hispanic superstition that if you do you'll lose money um so I just straight up don't and like all my friends were like that's so weird like you putting your bag on the floor affects that in zero ways which I know that like I know that money will not literally be removed from my wallet if I put it on the floor but like just like being raised with that mindset of like you don't put your like you like don't walk around like barefoot and things like that like just things like like simple things like that where like just like cultural like shifts I guess the biggest one that I know for me that like made people like completely lose their mind was like the like the superstition like you rub an egg on a baby I don't know if that's just a Peruvian thing or if that's like a white Hispanic thing um but I know like for me when I was like really little the first time I went to Peru they like rubbed an egg on me because it like gets rid of the bad spirits and like I told it to like a friend and they thought it was so strange. So like, just like little superstitions might also be like a big culture shock in a way. Yeah, sorry. I thought someone was gonna like add something and I was like, well, it's a little quiet. So our second question is, what are some challenges you face as a Latin American student? If no one, I'll start. Um, this one was a weird experience I had freshman year of college. And um, I was for some reason clumped together with the other La um, Hispanic Latin student in my um, dorm. Um, it was strange because we had never talked before and we had no common interest. Um, but because we were both, um, you know, Hispanic, we were both Latin. I, I'm Mexican. I can't remember if he was, but I think he, the, the our mutual friend introduced us as if we were both Mexican but I cannot tell you if he actually is and it was a bit weird to just automatically be just oh you're you're obviously going to be friends with him when I knew nothing about him he was a very nice dude but we did not become friends or anything else that my friends wanted so it's just a weird experience I That definitely sounds like um, not a fun time, not a fun time to for people to assume that, oh, because you're Hispanic, you're automatically friends with other Hispanic people. But for me, I think the biggest challenge as like being a Latin American student at a predominantly white school is just missing home or missing the culture. Like, you know, I speak, or I speak Spanish at home and like obviously at UChicago, no one speaks Spanish on the regular. <laughs> like it's an American university, everyone's speaking English, right? And so sometimes when I would get the chance to speak Spanish to someone, I'd be like, oh, finally, man, like finally I get to speak like the language that my house speaks, you know? And it's like just having to, being forced to like find comfort um, where you know that the majority of the school population already has like their source of some sort of comfort, like automatically is definitely an experience that I went through. And this is like a little off track, but I, I tell this story all the time when people ask me this question and Alexis and Marcella have heard it. Um, I'm sure that maybe someone else in this room has heard it, but when I was really missing home, I went to a Mexican American neighborhood in Chicago called Pilsen and I ate some really good food. I was especially missing my mother that week and I had to like go and seek um, comfort from a, from in a town separate from my school because I'm Latin American and because the school itself doesn't really cater specifically to Latin American students, if that makes sense. So like, having to find these spaces where you're comfortable as a Latin American and where you're comfortable with your own culture and just finding these spaces that remind you of home is I think one of the challenges of being Latin American um, here in the United States and going to a predominantly white school, if that makes sense. Yeah, I know for me, the biggest challenges I faced was like food. Like as I was saying kind of in her story, like for example I grew up like eating a lot of Peruvian food a lot of Mexican food a lot of Cuban food and so going to a school where that wasn't very readily available was like a very big culture shock like I showed up to campus like with my own hot sauce like that's how much I knew that I needed to prep myself like that hot sauce was with me through thick and thin I'd get like some bad mac and cheese from like the dining hall and I'd throw hot sauce on it for some flavor like that was my biggest challenge was like food and like how to adjust like to a dining hall that's catered to people that were that didn't grow up on primarily ethnic food so that was the biggest thing I faced like trying to like find restaurants that like 
I still haven't found a Peruvian restaurant in Chicago. Maybe I haven't been looking hard enough, but like, I know like that's like a source of comfort for me. Like being able to find, like go around and like eat papa la boncaina or eat lomo saltado and things like that. So that was the biggest challenge I faced. I feel like as a Latin American student. And now for the third question is, how do you stay connected with your culture in college? Um, I could really quick add my way I stay connected. As I mentioned earlier, and as I've mentioned plenty of other times within Education USA programming, I'm a part of an organization for Latin American students. So I think that's the biggest way I've stayed connected, like hanging out with other people that are also Hispanic, that are also going to the same school as me. And so being able to like listen to the same music that I would at home or being able to like share meals or share like, like similar stories and experiences. That's the biggest way I've stayed connected. Like joining this community has really helped me like remember what it's like being in a community with other Hispanic people and what it's like to like talk about experiences that they understand and things like that. Yeah, and kind of similar to what I, um, my answer in the last question, but just finding comfortable spaces or spaces where you feel comfortable connecting to your culture um, is so important. So Alexis has the Latin organization, which hopefully I can join next year because it was definitely missing in my college experience last year. Um, but just honestly talking to people who come from the same culture or finding these kinds of people, um, finding, you know, Hispanic, Latino friends. That in and of itself is just comforting because you can, if you do speak Spanish, uh, I assume everyone here speaks Spanish, but um, speaking Spanish, um, just every once in a while, honestly, really helped me just feel more, not really at home, but just feel more connected to as if I was at home and finding these little spaces around your school. So like I mentioned, um, Chicago has a Mexican-American city or in a Mexican-American neighborhood and you go there and you know, they had like the tortillera on the corner, they had um, the candy store on another and they had a bunch of authentic Mexican restaurants and it just like walking into these places just reminded me so much of home and it just made me feel comfortable and it made me feel more connected to, the, to my culture and it made me feel safe so finding these types of spaces whenever wherever you go and to college is so important to staying connected with your culture is what I would say yeah, I think it's really important to like keep talking span to keep talking Spanish, especially when like you don't take Spanish classes and everyone else only speaks English. So I would be constantly calling, um, you know, my mom because it was exclusively Spanish. I think another way I felt more connected was by just kind of through music. And especially when I was in my room or I was cleaning, I was like, okay, it's time to put on my cleaning playlist music, where it was all like exclusively like early 2000s and, and all in Spanish, or if not, it was playing like Selena. It was just, I just had to listen to more music in Spanish because I just felt like, you know, it just made me feel more homesick, but at the same time, it made me feel like I was actually at home because here's like this, like Julieta Venegas is like playing at like nine in the morning as I'm like cleaning my room. It felt like, okay, this is okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny you say that, Marcela, because I it, like it literally just reminded me of the moment I had when I was at school. Like I was cleaning, my dorm room was a mess, and I was like, you know what? My mother would be so disappointed in me if she saw me like this. So I put on La India, which is my mom's like favorite artist ever, and I'm like blasting ese hombre, and I'm like cleaning my, I'm like making my bed, putting my stuff in the laundry, like just like simple things like that that remind me of home definitely helped me. Like La India really was there for me on some late night studying, like blasting that. I feel so bad for my neighbors. Like, yes, I was blasting it on my like headphones, but I also was like singing out loud. So they still were listening to it anyways. Um, so that def like music definitely helped. Yeah, and I kind of want to like, not necessarily, to, I kind of want to add on, not necessarily to the music thing, but yeah, just right before um, we, we come to this last question, I just want to mention that speaking Spanish is honestly such a great help. And personally, my biggest fear being at college is losing all my Spanish because um, I'm a fluent speaker, right? But I didn't grow up in a Spanish speaking country. So I'm already on thin ice and going to a school where I don't speak Spanish on the regular, the ice is just getting thinner. So speaking Spanish is just so comforting. And honestly, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it really was. Like the first time I had a Spanish conversation, um again when I was in college it like literally cured me for like a whole day I was feeling good the rest of the day so just doing small things like that that you don't think are a big deal is something that can really help 
but yeah with that um we can go ahead to our very last question and then i believe after this we'll do our if there's any questions we'll answer those but our last question for each other that um, i want to ask you guys what opportunities are available for latin students Yeah, I can go ahead and take this one first. So the I'd say the biggest thing for our Latin students, especially if you're bilingual, is just the classic um, job opportunities. I would say um, on campus looking for internships. If you do go study abroad and you look for internships during the summer, or if your school offers some sort of like career help, having that um, bilingualness or having that, oh, I speak Spanish and English on your resume can really help you find the, these kinds of opportunities. Um, I feel like that kind of factored in a little bit um, with me getting this internship here at Education USA Guadalajara and being here with you guys today. Um, my ability to speak Spanish was definitely something that um, boosted my application as well. So just having that ability to speak two languages definitely helps when you're at college in America. Yeah, I definitely agree in terms of like the power of speaking two languages is really helpful. Also, like just like something as simple, like it's really nice to be able to like talk to like for example, like we have a taco truck that comes every day like at our library and it's nice to like talk to them in their like native language. Um, but other opportunities that are, are available for Latin students, um, the biggest one I know of that our school provides is that individual like clubs will provide grants and things like that. Like for example, like student government for people of color. So like literally just being Hispanic can like get you money sometimes. Like oftentimes like these grants, like you can talk about like, They'll be like, talk briefly about your culture, or they'll ask you about like how being Latin has affected being a student here at that university and things like that. And you can like literally apply for like a couple hundred dollars of like grants or like scholarships and things like that. So that's super exciting. Like literally just like looking around your community, you can like be paid to like be an active part of it. So that's the biggest opportunity I can think of that University of Chicago provides. I don't know if I can think of any more, I'll be honest. So nothing to add here. And so with that, we will now move on to the question and answer portion of our um, call today. I saw someone in the chat um, ask a little while back, how do you set an application if you live in Mexico? Oftentimes universities will have a portion on their website where they have an application like section, where they talk about things like the Common App, but they oftentimes will have a, like a separate tab or something like that for international students. Like I know, for example, like off the top of my head, like I know Princeton had a separate application for international students. Oftentimes um, colleges also will just require you to, to turn in the same application as domestic students. So it really depends on which school you're applying to. Um, most of the time they will have that information available on their website. Hi everyone and hi girls. Thank you for that uh, meaningful information. So I also have uh, other questions uh, for you on the chat. Thank you, Alexis, to um, take that um, question um, from Jose Manuel. And also Jose Manuel, we will encourage you to reach out to your closest education USA center because that's what we do here at Education USA. As Jandim, as Jandim mentioned at the beginning um, of the presentation, we are 26 advising centers. So um, either if you're from Mexico City, Guadalajara, uh, Puebla, Monterrey, um, there will be one of us um, ready to talk to you and um, explain you the process on how to apply to a US university if you are um, uh, Mexican or if you are in Mexico. Um, uh, girls, also I have uh, another question for you. So the first one is um, Diana Ramirez and she said, um, or she asked, uh, when do you get that prompt? Do you have to add it to the application like the prompts that you were explaining at the beginning? Where do you find those? 
So I think um, I can take this one. I think what U Chicago does, they make a very big deal out of it because, you know, it's their whole thing. You hear U Chicago, apply to U Chicago, you're going to hear about this essay. So they have like specific dates to where they put the prompts up, but I believe it's either at the same time or even before the Common App actually opens itself. And the Common App has been open for a month. So um, the Common Application is the most used application to apply to colleges in the United States. Um, it's where the majority of um, schools in the United States are available for to apply to. So, and that opens August 1st. So the U Chicago Uncommon Essay Prompts should already be up either on the U Chicago website or whatever method you're using to apply. Maybe you're using Common App, Coalition App, or any other method. Um, they should already be up there. So if you look up U Chicago Essay Prompts 2020, what would next year be? Or 2021, 2022. Yeah. Uh, U Chicago Uncommon Essay Apps, um, 2021 to 2022, they should already be on the website. So you can go look for them um, today if you'd like. Yeah, I just checked right now while I was saying that um, they are 100% up. They're actually, I think they came out, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, and it was, again, I, I would have said a very big deal. They posted on their Facebook, on their Instagram. So it is already up and available for you to be able to see. Um, the essays this year, there's, um, so I'm looking at right now, there's five essay, uncommon essay prompts. And the sixth one every year is always, you can choose one of the previous prompts, which is what I did my year. Um, I didn't use a prompt that was for that year. I used a previous prompt. So you Chicago will always let you look at previous uncommon prompts that you can also answer. Thank you, Alexis. And if, if you can, you can also write um, on the chat the, the link so they can go directly to uh, to check those prompts. Um, we have also another question um, from Santiago. Those the extracurriculars are included in the price of tuition of each university or, or it is something you pay after entering. This varies according to what organization you're in. Oftentimes, things that are student government sponsored, often you'll be given a student services fee at the beginning of the school year that will cover things like that. But oftentimes, individual clubs will have their own dues, um, which isn't covered within tuition or room and board. So it really depends on the activity. Sometimes clubs don't have any fees. Sometimes they have fees just if you wanna purchase t-shirts or memorabilia. So it really depends uh, on the club, but oftentimes tuition does not cover club fees. Thank you, Alexis. Um, also, uh, there has been um, a couple of questions regarding how to apply if you live in Mexico. And again, please contact your closest Education USA Advising Center. We are going to, at the end of the presentation, we are going to uh, share that information with you where you can find um, the information of your um, nearest uh, advising center. Um, okay. Uh, Another question, there's another question uh, from Jocelyn that says, how much the intensity of the program allow extracurricular activities? For example, if I will apply for an LLM. So I'm gonna take this question just because LLMs are uh, graduate programs. So this session is um, more focused on undergraduate programs, uh, but the types of activities that you are going to, um, or that universities are looking for graduate candidates are different than the ones that um, universities are looking for um, undergraduate candidates. So again, um, since this is maybe a graduate topic, um, you can, schedule an appointment with your uh, closest advisor um, so she or he can discuss with you uh, what type of uh, extracurricular activities you can um, start doing or uh, maybe you are currently doing for uh, improve your application. 
Um, we also have an um, interesting questions regarding um, your experience with exams. What was your experience with exams like the SAT, TOEFL, and so on? Evelyn asks. Yeah, so I can go ahead and speak on this first. Sorry, Alexis, I hit the unmute button right before you. Um, but my experience was actually relatively simple. So for me, um, my school actually had us take the practice SAT, which if you don't know, it's like an official college board exam. I had to take, I started taking practice SATs in eighth grade. So I took, I have like five practice SATs under my belt. So really I just use these to kind of like focus on my score. And then I took the actual SAT and it was slightly lower than my practice one. And I was like, so I know I can do better. I know it's a possibility because I've already done better. So then from there, what I did was I just took the SAT one more time and then I got a better score and I called it a day because the majority of the schools that I was applying to were actually score optional. So um, I didn't really need to like push myself for a big score, which if you don't know what score optional is, it just means that you don't have to send in your test scores to that school to apply to it. So because of that, I was okay with my SAT score and I just took it twice. And with that, I just turned in my score and I was like, yeah, sounds good. So for me, it was relatively simple. I don't know what it was like for Marcela um, or Alexis, if you guys wanna go ahead and speak on that. Okay. I think I also beat Alexis again. Um, for me, because I took, um, I took the ACT, which is essentially the same test, but like there's a science section to make it a little bit more quirky. That's to make it interesting. That's pretty much it. For me, I really just put it off till my junior year because I was like, I'm not worrying about this before junior year. Um, my school offered um, some tutoring sessions for the ACT. Um, I took those. I took the exam twice. I did better my first time and not my second time, which was weird because I was under a lot of stress the first time. And then also because, you know, the, my top schools were also score optional. I said, this score is good enough. It shows that I can do it. So I am done for the day. And that was my experience. Yeah, I know for me, similar to Aura, I took the SAT kind of young. I took the first, the first time I took the SAT was like in seventh grade. And then my school also required us to take the SAT, uh, the PSAT our sophomore year. So all sophomores had to take the PSAT, um, which isn't used for um, your like school, like which isn't used in the application process, but it is helpful to get an understanding of how the SAT works. And then um, I took the SAT multiple times throughout my junior no, I took it mostly primarily in my S my senior year because at that point I was just trying to like boost up my grade because junior year I got a pretty all right score, but I wasn't happy with it at all. <laughs> so I started taking it more my senior year to try to boost up either my reading score, reading score. Once I got that to the grade I wanted, I was working on primarily on my math score. So that was my biggest experience. I also took the ACT, um, which I know Marcela also took. Um, but I only took it once just to kind of get a feel for it. Thank you, girls. And um, so last question. Uh, how do you choose classes? Uh, because here in Mexico, you choose an undergraduate program and take the classes key, uh, that, the schools, that the school or the program uh, gives to you. How does it work there? I think this is a very interesting question. Yeah, so um, I can go ahead and get us started. And if Alexis and Michelle want to add anything or if I miss anything, go ahead. But here in the United States, um, whatever career track you choose, you actually don't, there's no like set, oh, you have to take the classes in this order. You know, there's obviously major requirements that you have to get done by a certain year. So like I'm a double math and psychology major. And for both of those majors, I have to take a good amount of classes before my third year. But you essentially just get to choose whatever classes you want. And this kind of varies from school to school because some schools like the University of Chicago have what we call general education requirements. And the general education requirements at UChicago are just a tiny bit insane. Um, they take up the majority of your classes and you take classes, you're required to take classes across all subjects because we have what's called a liberal arts education and they want to make well-rounded students. 
So um, a lot of schools have these general education requirements, so you have to take them at some point during your school career. But then some schools actually don't have general education requirements. So at those schools, it's really up to you to take what you want. I think as long as you, by the end of whatever year you graduate, take the classes um, that you need for your major, you can pick when you take them and you can pick which ones you take, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of options here um, in the States and there's a lot of options at UChicago. But like I said, it kind of varies career to career. But at the end of the day, you're choosing your classes, classes and you're kind of choosing your own career path. Um, I think something to add about what makes U Chicago a bit different in choosing classes is we have um, pre-registration. So essentially we bid for classes um, and, you know, we say, okay, I want bio first and physics and like my like English class or in, in like an art class. And you send that in and then a week or two later, like, look at your classes and you see what you get and then you can change. But I think for other colleges, it's different where you have a day and a time and you have to be the first one to like instantly enroll in that class. And if, you know, you're a first year, or you don't really know what you're doing, you might not get like the professor you want or the timing you want. Um, so that's just to keep that in mind that I know it becomes kind of a brutal process to to actually get the classes you want um, in other colleges. So. Yeah, trying to piggyback off of Marcela in terms of like different schools do it differently for the most part. Most of the schools I know of do it like not the way you Chicago does it. They mostly do first come first serve. And so are the another, other schools, I know that they do it in like a tier kind of way. Like the people that have all the requirements done and done all this, they get to get first pick and then they'll open it up to the next tier. And then whoever is at the last, they get whatever classes haven't been chosen. Um, I guess we're kind of fortunate with you, Chicago, in terms of first come, first serve, you get a little more leeway. You don't have to worry about like getting on immediately at like 8 a.m. to get whatever class you want, but it really just depends on what school you're going to. Perfect. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for that, um, for that information, girls. I think it, it, it was um, very, uh, comprehensive. So um, we don't have any more questions, but um, if at some point you have more questions or you want to start your uh, process looking for universities and programs in the US, again, please contact your nearest Education USA Advising Centers. The links are on the chat and also on Facebook. So we are here to help. And remember that all our services are completely free uh, of charge. So that's an advantage. Um, again, thank you for attending. Um, and here is the information where you can contact us as well. You can contact our panelists, um, today's panelists. So thank you very much to everyone and have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Hope Thank you all for being help. here.